Good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Medhurst. I'm here with uh, two very special guests who are joining me from Emerson College in the United States, and uh, they've been very busy. Their names are Owen Buxton and uh, Sadia Abu Hussein. They're students and organizers at Emerson College, and they were present during this giant assault by police on April 25th. Uh, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Yeah, I'm Sadia. Um, I'm a senior and organizer with SJP at Emerson College. I'm Owen. I'm also a senior uh, and an organizer with SJP at Emerson. Could you guys tell me how you first came to be involved in uh, pro-Palestine protests? Like what motivated you? Uh, what prompted you to just go ahead and, and become uh, involved with direct action? Um, I joined early this semester because I was, I was looking for a place where people were also angry about this after uh, going to school last semester where no one talked about it and it drove me crazy. Um, mm. I just, I needed a place to put into action things that I was thinking about. Yeah, and I um, I got involved with, I was one of the um, first kind of group of people who in October of last semester got together and it really did just start as um, everybody, um, you know, who was feeling the same anger and responsibility and, you know, need to like take action and understand, you know, the role that we were playing as, you know, Americans, but then as American students on top of that. Um, yeah. Well, it's very brave of you guys. And uh, you, you, you might have seen um, a viral video I did last week where I was basically just praising all of you. I did it in English and French because this has become a worldwide movement. What are your thoughts when you see people in other countries, students in other countries, uh, you know, participating in this, uh, taking up the mantle and just uh, sort of copying or mimicking in the, in a good sense, of course, what you guys are doing. How does that make you feel? Um, it gives me a great sense of hope. I just saw that there's the first ever faculty encampment that was just started. Um, so that's huge. Um, it just makes me feel like this is a, a movement that is just beginning and it's not stopping. And I think as we go into the summer, I think it'll be very uh, exciting to see what happens. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for myself, like, I think it's really important for us to remember that everything that the student movement in America has become is a direct result of, you know, the things that we have, you know, learned and seen from Palestine and from Palestinian people who have been engaging in the type of you know, um, in this type of protest and resistance beyond this type of protest and resistance for decades. And, you know, even beyond that, you know, a lot of our organizers, myself, I'm Egyptian. Um, and, you know, that's a, a big reason why this, you know, my presence in this movement and, you know, the work that I've been doing at Emerson was, it's not really optional. Um, and it's not really a choice. But, um, and, and beyond that, like, so many of our organizers are black and brown people, people of color from, you know, different communities and different histories that, you know, really can recognize a moment of, um, you know, how important it is for like solidarity and unity, especially in intense moments of oppression um, and repression. There's also, I've seen there have been lots of um, Jewish uh, students protesting, taking part in the pro-Palestine movement. And this is, it's funny because they the media call the the movement anti-Semitic, but ironically, as I as I just pointed out, you have lots of uh, uh, Jews who are standing right there with you. Um, tell us about that and and how they they feel that they've been harassed uh, uh, by the police and and for just expressing um, anti-Israel or, or pro-Palestine beliefs. Yeah, I mean, I think that the role that Jewish students, but also just Jewish organizers and activists throughout history have played um, in, you know, any anti-Zionist movements is like super pertin pertinent to um, calling out sort of like the inherent hypocrisy of like the liberal and Zionist structures that, you know, are everywhere and um, that were, you know, forced to like, you know, be a part of. And I think that so much of um, what 
I realized Indian Canyon itself is that like, you know, every person was there, every type of person that you possibly could think of, you could find at the, <laughs> that you, you could find at the encampment um, because the community was just so broad. And, you know, we just did exactly what was instinctual for us to do during the encampment. And that was share, you know, share prayer, share food, share, you know, education, share um, community with each other. And um, I think that, the way that, you know, the, the encampment itself, probably some of the most beautiful time that I have ever spent at Emerson. Um, and the things that ruined it most were the presence of police, the intimidation of, from police, the intimidation from administration. And that's what becomes agitational, you know, intimidation from counter protesters. And even then, you know, you know, we had we were in a spot where the entire city was walking through anyone from the whole city of Boston could walk through the encampment at pretty much any time. And um, yeah, I think that the way that we were able to kind of really sustain like the the community, the joy, the education, the solidarity for Palestine, the focus on, on Gaza is like exactly what we are trying to call out because, you know, they're making it seem like it's impossible to exist that way. It's impossible for all of us to come together in community, fight for the same thing and take care of each other while we do so. Um, but it's not, it's not impossible at all. It's actually what most of us are, you know, um, like drawn to do. Um, yeah. And I myself am partially Jewish ethnically. Um, and it makes me, it, it upsets me to, to think that there are students at Emerson or anywhere in the country who are feeling unsafe because of our encampments um, but anti-Zionism does not mean anti-Semitism. To me, it means anti-genocide and anti-occupation. And uh, I think if anybody who walked through our encampment could see everything on the walls that we painted uh, or chalked, um, it was a community about love and about education first and foremost. And I think uh, this narrative of um, the student movement's being painted as anti-Semitic is just uh, a reason to get them to stop, I think, and to turn public uh, opinion. And and really quickly, I mean, like something that I heard a lot from, you know, the Jewish students and the Jewish community members that were there and present at the encampment is that, you know, there was no other place that they saw that they needed to be that, you know, like, um, everything that we were there to do, you know, demand divestment, to demand, you know, a ceasefire and an end to, you know, the genocide, to demand an end to the occupation, um, everything that we were there to do um, and and demand was absolutely everything that people and, you know, the Jewish community members who were there felt that they, they needed to be fighting for. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy uh, hearing all of this because I I was making the point that th these are the largest student protests since the uh, Vietnam War and, and specifically anti-war student protests. And you guys have not only um, uh, you know captured that that feeling um, of uh, opposing the system, but you've also captured all the good things of that movement as you as you were pointing out some very um uh you know lovely behavior just commute really a sense of community and i really appreciate that you you took the time to uh, underscore that um i hate to jump to now a more negative aspect of it but could you guys perhaps tell me about that night uh specifically april 25th where they they just charged at you i mean oh and you specifically i wanted to ask you the second you joined how are you doing are you feeling better but i thought i'd leave it to now so you can just you know uh, uh, just say whatever you want and give give you the floor um you are doing better, I hope. Uh, and uh, just tell us what happened that night. What happened to you guys? How are you feeling? What, how are you feeling afterwards? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm feeling much better. I've recovered. Um, well, I physically I've recovered. Um, the early morning of the 25th, I think it was around 2 a.m. Um, we'd been on a high alert all night, uh, you know, police presence. Um, but we we were locked arms and they came in with riot gear. Um, there were hundreds of them. They came at us from both sides and they just tore through us. Um, they definitely targeted our organizers. Um, 
I was, I was brutalized pretty hard. They, um, they tackled me to the ground almost immediately, uh, threw me into a statue. Um, a bunch of them fell on top of me. Uh, one of them hit me with a baton in the back. Then they pressed me onto the ground, um, the brick ground and slammed my head into the ground. And I had a big bruise on this side of my face. And they kept screaming at me, stop resisting, stop resisting. And I could not resist if I wanted to, um, because there were seven grown men. And I'm, I'm a skinny guy. Like, it does not take seven cops to take me down. Um, but there were seven cops pressing down on every part of my body into this brick. And then one of them applied pressure to my ear with this thumb, and it just completely shut down my body. It was it was like some kind of pressure point. I I'd never felt anything like it before. And they kept telling me not to resist, but I could not resist. And I felt like I was sinking into the brick and everything started to go black. And I thought, I I'm gonna die. I, I actually thought I was going to die. And that's not a moment I'll ever forget. Um, but next thing I know, um, I'm up, I'm walking, I'm dripping blood. I see the blood of my friends all over the brick. And now they're claiming that no students were injured. I look around and I see every one of my friends being brutalized by the police. And they're saying that no students got injured. <sighs> and, you know, I uh, got put in a cruiser. Uh, at this point, adrenaline had started to wear off a little bit and I could feel how severely messed up my arm was. Um, they ignored my cries. Um, I got to the precinct and they told me I was exaggerating. Um, eventually an EMT did come to try and treat me. I was screaming and crying and bleeding all over the place. And he said, we could go to the hospital, but then you'll just have to come back here and it'll add probably seven hours to this process. Um, oh, how and lovely. the cops kept saying, Sorry, what? How how lovely. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, not yeah, exactly. And uh the cops kept telling us, "Don't worry, you'll be out of here in an hour." Um so I said, "Okay, fine. I'll just I'll, I'll suck it up and go to the hospital afterwards." We were in jail for 12 hours from like 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um I didn't receive medical attention. Uh I was in pain the entire time. Um, eventually we got out and I went right to the hospital. Um, and the doctor said I had a concussion and minor bruises, um, didn't, didn't break my arm, didn't sprain my arm or anything. It was just a tendon problem. Uh, but the worst part of it was looking in their eyes and seeing their eyes light up as they beat up black and brown students like they were laughing they were laughing as they beat me they were laughing and i some of them had shame on their face and some of them had absolute joy like they'd been dying for something like this for a while and that is the image that will stick with me the most i think Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, as an organizer, um, it's really hard to like be in a moment where like, especially that night, you know, I saw two things happening. I saw one, this imminent threat of the police who, um, you know, is obviously always historically violent and racist and misogynist. And it was just so clear in the way that they were targeting and brutalizing black women and black and brown men. Um, and, you know, that's information that we had had. And, you know, it's really hard to ever um, anticipate exactly how the police will respond or exactly how the, the police will come in. Because like Owen said, the police officers themselves, you could tell on their faces that half of them were just happy to be there um, and get a chance to swing their batons. And the other half of them had no idea why they were even there or, you know, if they, you know, you could really tell, you know, the moral conflict that was happening like amongst them. But mm -hmm. again, as an organizer, I saw two things happening that night. One, I saw, we were, um, a group of 13 students at Emerson were arrested in March. Um, Owen and I were, were part of that group. And uh, during those arrests, you know, 
when the um when the threat of police became you know face to face with all of us so many less students were ready to stand their ground so many less students were ready to stick beside each other mm. to protect each other and then you know less than a month later almost exactly one month later we were in the encampment after days of building that community and i looked around and i saw hundreds of people linking arms ready to defend each other ready to stand by each other um and ready to face this threat that at the time we had no idea what it would actually look like and what it could actually do to us, you know? Um, and I think like Owen, you know, Owen and I, like we were actually right next to each other in the moment when it happened. And then the way that they were just slinging and throwing and grabbing and pulling and, you know, kneeling and suffocating and strangling and beating and punching and the things that they were doing to people somehow Owen and I ended up on opposite ends of the the alley and I think for me what was the most terrifying thing was just the complete aimlessness like we had um two different groups who had confrontations with the police at the front and at the back of the encampment and the group at the front of the encampment they were um the police warned them about like um you know oh you know you can leave, like you should leave now or, you know, arrests are about to start. Da, da, da. The end that we were in, there was nothing. They just all charged I at heard, you. All I heard was you can leave. And one second later, people were coming down. Yeah. People yeah. were being pulled down, dragged down. People were being beat and people were huddling, you know, linking their arms together stronger and just waiting, just waiting for, for what would happen. And there was one point where, um, I had, you know, someone had pulled me into like a building, um, and which, you know, and was the reason why I did not get arrested that day. Um, someone had pulled me into the building, into a building and we had been locked the police officers because they were policing and raiding the alley until far long after the students uh, were there. And, um, they, when I had walked back out at some point to cross, um, you know, I had to be um, monitored. I had, you know, someone had to escort me. And when I looked around, I saw the alley that had just been full of, you know, people smiling and laughing in the face of this, like such insane, dangerous uncertainty and, you know, sticking together and um, linking arms had turned into this completely destroyed and abandoned and surveilled play like um like plot i just all of a sudden could not even recognize the place that we had spent four days sleeping eating and you know learning in um and it was terrifying it was so terrifying and what was even more terrifying is that the police even the administrators and the faculty and the staff who were present that day who were trying to um you know mitigate the situation they had no power they had no power they were being screamed at they were being grabbed they were being they were being threatened by the police they were being intimidated by the police the entire time and that has become one of the biggest things is you know it's it's unfortunate to think about the fact that we already know the way that police the police function we already know that the police are not here to protect the people mm. we've learned that from decades of lessons and from decades of brutality on black and brown people historically and you know, in that moment, it just really became at the forefront that the fact that, you know, the fact that people were seeing this brutality and this like absolute horrible functioning of our police be affecting students um, rather than black and brown people was the only thing that I think that, you know, raised people's ears. You know, the fact that, you know, our the students were being confronted with police brutality that black and brown people have faced for so long. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, opened a, an, 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 a moment to have a conversation that we should have been having and we should be having um, for for as long as it takes to make sure that, you know, any attempts for dissent and protest and, you know, for change are not just brutally, dis like brutally beat into the ground um, in the way that they attempt to, because that's no way, I mean, we already know that 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 won't kill a movement. 75 years of, you know, absolute brutal force and destruction and genocide in Palestine. And here we are in a moment where Palestine's movement has 
you know, completely taken over the globe and has strengthened communities that never even imagined being in, you know, a moment or, you know, as close to, you know, a revolution or as close to um, some real change as we are right now. That's why they came down on you, uh, I believe. And could I ask you guys, did the university call the police on you? Because that's a pattern we've been seeing across the country where uh, students are finding out, lo and behold, it's it, it, it's not just the regular police on top of it, it's the actual riot police called directly by the university over a bunch of tents, you know, uh, to, to put it to put it simply. So did the university call the police on you? And, and what are your um, suspicions about how the staff uh, are behaving towards you? Because um, I've seen something promising uh, uh, about, you know, the university paying some of the uh, fees or legal fees, but does that... Does that make up for what just happened to you guys? Yeah, I will say um, something that we emphasized. Um, we had a negotiation meeting with administration a couple days before um, the encampment was raided. And we made clear to them that, you know, at this point, especially after the first um, 13 arrests that happened at Emerson, um, they were promising so much about, oh, you know, we respect people's right to freedom of speech. We respect students' right to protest. We respect da 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 And they made that the forefront of their re-imaging, you know, that they are not here to attack anybody's right to, pro to protest and they're just working to make protesting safer on campus. What that really meant was they're increasing policing on campus. They're increasing the militancy of our um, the militancy of our campus and the vulnerability of black and brown students and of student organizers and activists. Um, and so, again, that inherent contradiction that is just so obvious. But we had in the meeting that we had with um, administration like a, a couple days before, maybe not even two days before the encampment was raided. I'm, you know, we had made clear, we had said to the president, to his face, we had said, look, you know, if you're going to stand beside what you say, I mean, we're here to tell you that we're not leaving until our demands are met. We're not leaving until there is transparency, until there is um, divestment, until there is a call for a ceasefire on behalf, like from the institution and until there is an end to the attack on the student organizers um, and, and on protesters. Um, and... We had said, look, if you're really committing to what you said you're going to commit to about protecting peaceful protests and about protecting the right to freedom of speech, then you will you will put your body on the line if that's what it comes to. You know, if that's really what your commitment is, then mm -hmm. if the police if you and you have no involvement and you have no control over what the police will do, then you will be there to defend your students with your body if that's really what you mean. Um, and obviously. They were not there. Um, there has been a lot of like misconstruing about, um, you know, what the what the university has does um, has done. First of all, absolutely nothing materially at the university do will do can ever make up for what they have put our students through, for what they have put um, our community through, and through what they have done to participate in the genocide in Gaza. Nothing materially will ever ever make up for that, and um, you know. What we've heard is that we know for a fact that we paid for at least over 75 percent of the bail that happened that day uh, or of the bail of students that day. Right. Um, there might have been a couple of admin or like staff who, you know, were authorized to use their um, to use their school sanctioned like cards to uh, bail people out. But over 118 people were arrested and we were able to find those people and reach those people significantly quicker than the administration could because that's not what they're built for. And the people who were um, within the institution trying to do that were the black and brown employees who were who were there caring about their students and who right. wanted to to do what they can for them and who are doing it autonomously on their own accord and because of their own, you know, you know, um, because of their own moral obligations and solidarity and because of their love for their students. Uh, Emerson's an incredibly small school. The people that we saw brutalized that day, those were our friends. Those were our families. Those were our community members. Those were people that whose faces we have seen and re-seen, you know, for so long. Yeah. Um, yeah. Owen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, can you remind me of the the question? Well, I was asking if the if the university um called the police on you, the right police, and also I was asking if um 
you know, do you have any suspicions about uh, what the school are doing? Because, you know, the facade that they're presenting uh, for, from, from my point of view and what just uh, Sadia outlined is that they, you know, they want to pay for the bail of, of a couple of students and, and make it look like they're, they're conceding something. But, but um, how are the staff behaving towards you and, and uh, are they meeting your demands, basically? So after the 13 of us were arrested in March, uh, there was a very deliberate um, hold on where the Emerson police were sent. I know we did a couple of actions and the administrative administration made it a big deal. Like, hey, we didn't send ECPD. Like, that's great for us. Like, aren't you guys happy? Um, <laughs> but when it came down to it, ECPD infiltrated the encampment first before any other people did. Um, and after the meeting with the president, he delivered us a letter essentially washing his hands of us and saying, it's it's not up to me, it's up to Michelle Wu, the mayor. Um, mm -hmm. So whatever happens, happens. And that absolved him of any responsibility, I suppose. And soon after that, uh, we made a statement on the news to Michelle Wu saying, protect us, don't do this to us. And within an hour, Boston PD and state police were there. Um, Can I just interrupt briefly? I mean, she said today, the uh, the mayor, Michelle, she said that you wanted to be arrested. When I read that, I mean, I was like, what's, what's your reaction to that? I don't want to be arrested. I especially didn't want to be arrested a second time. That was like, that was a disaster scenario. I did not want that to happen. But when it comes down to it in the moment, I will never not put my body on the line for this cause. Never. There's no scenario. I was telling myself, the 13 of us were saying like, all right, guys, we're, we can't get arrested. Like everyone else can get arrested. We have all these new allies. The 13 of us, we have to like stay in the back and support. But when it came down to it, I needed to be there. Sadia needed to be there. We needed mm -hmm. to be there because anything that could happen to me anything i could go to jail four more times nothing like what is happening to the people in gaza will ever happen to me and i can go to sleep at night knowing that i i did something and that's more than a lot of people can say and really quickly on the um the stuff about you know who who made the call who whatever like owen said there were multiple times after the first time that we were arrested um, that we had, you know, a rally or something where, you know, they said that not only did they make sure, not only did they not send the ECPD to respond and be present there to make it safer. So admitting that, you know, ECPs, ECPD's presence would make the protests unsafer, but they also said that Mult claimed multiple times that they communicated with the BPD to make sure that the BPD either did not show up or, you know, just kept their distance from the students while they were rallying. And so there were two other times where they did have, you know, enough collaborate, uh, um, you know, where they collaborated enough with the BPD um, to, you know, protect their students, you know, whatever that means. And the thing about the location where our encampment was set is that um, it's very complicated in terms of whose jurisdiction it is. So whenever we're doing something that they don't want us to do, it's Emerson's jurisdiction and they, they get to, you know, use the student code of conduct mm -hmm. to do whatever they want to us. Um, but, you know, when we, you know, do something that is when Emerson does not want any more of the backlash and any more of the bad PR for the way that they've been brutalizing and targeting their students and suppressing pro Palestinian, um, you know, activism on campus. Um, I think that it was a similar situation to what happened at Columbia, the, um, what happened at Columbia, where, you know, the president was collaborating with the mayor um, to take down um, the encampment and to wash to try and wash um, um her hands, um, their hands of, you know, some type of responsibility. So at the end of the day, there is no way that Emerson is not complacent, involved, collaborating um, with, you know, whoever it is that made that final, who pushed that final button or made that final call to send in um, the state police in riot gear to take down and brutalize their students um, that day. And I also want to emphasize that 
the ordinance that we were um, delivered was an anti-homeless ordinance that Michelle Wu, um, that Michelle Wu's um, body, um, you know, put in place and I targets see. homeless people. It targets the setting up of camps on on public property. It targets the, you know, the creation of community, the creation of, you know, actual systems of food, of care, of aid. Um, cause that's another thing, you know, we were in that alley and we had, you know, houseless, our houseless neighbors who frequent that area staying with us. And it was probably, you know, very quickly it changed, but before the, the police came in there, it was probably the safest that any houseless people were on or near Emerson's campus, which is directly in downtown Boston, which they have entirely gentrified and they have entirely destroyed for so many of the black and brown people who have been there for decades. Um, and so again, just emphasizing the fact that the police came, the police who came in there to brutalize us that day, they have been brutalizing people for so much longer than that day. And the law that they use to justify that brutalization that day has been brutalizing houseless people, um, for so much longer, yeah. um, than that day. No, that's really scandalous. I mean, honestly, scandalous. Uh, it's like two, a scandal within a scandal. Um, can I ask you, uh, uh, guys, uh, what do you think of other uh, student protesters who have um, reached certain deals with their universities and then broken up their encampments? And, you know, uh, lo looking at the agreements, it's been something like, for example, that the university promises to raise uh, divestment uh, at a board meeting in a few months. Uh, is, is that something that you guys uh, uh, look down on as as, a, as an agreement? Would you ever do something like that? Like, what are your thoughts on these on these deals? I think uh, most of the concessions that I've seen so far from universities have been to uh, appease the the movement and to to instead of have us organizing on the streets and show uh, the power we have together. They want us to go into little committees and talk about it for months and months and months until we forget people forget about this and then it can just go away. Like all the all the committees that specifically Emerson created uh in 2020 after the George Floyd protests, those just went away. That, and that's exactly what they're hoping to do here. Mm -hmm. So I think the moment we let the system into our movement, we've 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 lost what we're doing. So I think we need to keep going the way we're going. And I think, um, I mean, like, like I said to every news reporter in when, when I was interviewed in the encampment, like, I'm not leaving until the demands are met or I'm dragged out of here by the police. And I was dragged out of there by the police. So now what do we do? We've got a whole summer. Yeah, um, I think, you know, this is something that we what I'm learning at this point, you know, the 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 movement was just, you know, is just such at a height at this current moment. And once, you know, a movement grows and, you know, falls into the hands of the masses, there's really no way um, as organizers to really get a grip or to try and control or contain anything that is happening, you know, so I'm. A couple of things, you know, I'm really empathetic, you know, especially as someone who has been, you know, who has, you know, completely destroyed my academic career in this last year because of everything that I've been doing organizing. Um, and like, you know, I, like, is really, I really understand the amount of pressure and the amount of sacrifice um, that it takes. So, I mean, what students are doing across campuses, I mean, no no one will no one can really understand a campus or a, you know a community and you know its response to whatever uh better than the people who have been building that movement there and there's so many reasons why you know organizers might you know decide to take that route um and the way that i see it i mean the way that i see it is that as long as we are continuously in lockstep and as long as we all know when it is time to um you know, say, fuck your bureaucracy and, you know, fuck your table if you're not going to meet us at, if you're not even going to sit here and talk to us at it for real. Um, as long as we know when it's time to do that and when it's time to unite and when it's time to hit the streets and it's time to, you know, you know, turn um, all of that into real 
action and, you know, into real action for Gaza and for the things that we're fighting for, um, then, I mean, again, about the inherent hypocrisy thing, it's just so inherent to all of the structures, especially Emerson. Emerson's a liberal arts institution, you know, and at so many higher educations function like this, where they claim to be on, you know, at the precipice of evolution, on the precipice of progress and, and whatnot, but they actually are structured to suppress progress and, and revolution and, and all of those things as, as they arise, you know? Um, so I, I mean, I don't think that the, the reality of, you know, that inherent hypocrisy not eventually being exactly what causes, you know, neoliberalism and every every way that it manifests in our societies to cave in on itself um, is is true. So I think that it's always valuable, you know, as students to like play to maintain pressure on every possible pulse on every possible side and direction as we possible as we can until our demands are met um but also like owen said that day um and in a moment like that there is really nothing else to do besides stick stand there and stick beside the people who you need to immediately protect and the people that you need to immediately defend. I mean, just like you said, you know, what did we say to Michelle Wu saying, do you know, that we wanted to get arrested? I mean, what I say is that everything that they have done to threaten us has been in the name of, you know, convincing us that our stance against genocide and that our stance against, you know, the complete destruction of Gaza's universities, of Gaza's society, um, and the, you know, systemic starvation and brutalization and displacement of Palestinians, like, um, if that's where we stand and, you know, what they're telling us is and we know that what they're telling us is not in favor of allowing us to resist that, um, then there's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to do. You, you know, you, you, it's funny, you guys reminded me, um, when you mentioned committees, uh, before the CIA, it was called the, uh, Office of Strategic Services in World War II, and there's a manual on field sabotage, and it says the best way to sabotage movements is to delegate things to committees and then make other committees and have meetings and <laughs> the opposite of everything you guys are doing which is direct action in the street you know occupying uh, uh and building encampments so it's very funny you mentioned that it's it, you it's available for download it's from 1944 anyone can find it but uh, uh you, you you take my point if i could just ask you guys what have your encounters been with uh, pro-israel um, or sh maybe we should say pro-genocide uh, counter-protesters. Um, how, uh, how have they been towards you, towards uh, the establishment? What, what experiences have you had with them? Yeah, I personally was harassed and assaulted by multiple Zionists during the encampment, both like physically and verbally. And um, many, many other organizers were as well. Um, and it's so interesting because that was the only time that you saw an interaction like that happen in the, in, in the encampment and in that space. And it was so clear who, you know, was bringing that and who was in, who was inviting that into the space. And it was the counter protesters, you know, who were there um, to further, you know, to like threaten the safety of our organizers, to threaten the safety of the community members who were there. Um, even, you know, there was a faculty, there was a staff member, a professor at, em at Emerson who just, you know, who was in there secretly recording a class while it was happening. And when he was asked to stop, it turned into a really uncomfortable and inappropriate um, conversation between him and I where, you know, he was incredibly condescending. He was incredibly um, uh, accusatory. He was, you know, just whatever. And I had to stop and I had to say, are you comfortable talking to me like that? Like, you know, as a professor, are you comfortable talking to a student like that? And he didn't know what to go. He didn't know where to go from there. Um, and so it's just so interesting because they manifest in so many different forms, you know, like the counter protesters and, you know, um, the pro Israel, like any pro Israel pre presence, it just really manifests in different, different forms, kind of like the way that the police, stand there unsure of why they're there, unsure of why they're arresting students, unsure of why they're, you know, participating in this, you know, you know, in this suppression, in this oppression. Um, 
you can just really tell. You can tell they're all there for different reasons. Some of them don't want to be there. Some of them are not sure why they're there. Um, and some of them are not even sure if they're, you know, mad at the right person or not. And I think that that was super reflective in the ways that, you know, <coughs> Zionists would come in and kind of just aimlessly, you know, threaten the encampment. And I've seen that, you know, now that our encampment has been, you know, swept and raided and and all of that, we've been spending a lot of time at other student, um, other universities encampments in Boston. And they've had a lot more, I think, of like aggressive, like um, Zionist interactions than we've had. Um, and even there, even there, it's just so clear how um, aimless it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll say, I think the, 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 the focus on the anti-Semitism narrative is because that is the only card they have to play against a genocide. And they know that. So whenever there's count, like at Emerson, we had like, what, like six counter protesters that were standing across the street, waving a flag. It was pathetic. It was sad. And whenever like anyone tried to engage with them, there's they don't have anything. They they can't defend their position because they know their position is wrong because their position is genocide. So the only thing they have to say is, hey, you can't do that to me. That's anti-Semitic. It's not anti-Semitic. Um, uh, similarly, I mean, I saw a bunch of my friends get harassed by Zionists. Um, there were a couple of physical altercations. And those were the only moments when, uh, uh, other than when the police raided, where there was any danger within our encampment. And like Sadia said, our encampment was open to the public. Unlike a lot of these other universities, we don't have a quad, we don't have anything. So we were in like a public alley. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, I think you you uh, surmised it quite um, quite eloquently that uh, the the interactions you had with with Zionists were, were rather pathetic. Uh, I think that's what that you were making uh as a point yes and um all the videos i've seen of you know when we did our encampment it was pretty soon after the first uh news about columbia had happened so there were not all these videos of all these different schools being horribly uh brutalized by the police and the zionist um counter protest that like i had not seen any videos of that when we did our encampment so now after our encampment when so many of these schools have uh, started similar ones, seeing the uh, the Zionist backlash, like I think at UCLA and um, even at yeah. MIT in Boston, it's terrifying. It's horrifying, and they're they are thro like throwing backpacks full of mice and f f um, fireworks, uh, and it's just it's speaking the quiet part out loud how yeah how how integral the occupation and um persecution of others is to their livelihoods that they're so terrified of upending that and i want to say that i know at least three or four people who before our encampment were staunchly zionist and had the critical thinking skills to think, if I'm afraid of this place, why don't I go and see it for myself? And they went there, saw the love, saw the lack of anti-Semitism, saw the actual uh, uplifting of Jewish voices and ended up getting arrested with us. So it comes down to critical thinking. Also, well, that's, that's very good that you've converted some people. Sorry, go ahead, Sidia. No, yeah. Also, I mean, like the the whole entire point and the messaging of the of the popular university for Gaza and the encampments that have been happening is that like, you know, we're taking the people are taking our education back. The people are taking our communities back. We're taking our you know, we're taking it back and we're putting things into pr into practice because I mean, the the way that, you know, counter protesting like zionist counter protesting relies so health how, like relies so much on aggression and on escalation on violence um in this that's it's the same way that you know israel's existence relies so much on violence and aggression because beyond that force it's just 
it's a lot of illusion. It's a lot of, you know, twisting the truth and believing these really false narratives and these really false things and demanding that is that that's the truth. And um, I think, you know, what I, I learned so much about how to continue. Uh, and I think a lot of our organizers and as an organization, we learned so much about how to continue doing the work that we were doing within the encampment um, throughout our organizing and now really understanding, you know, what it means to like physically experience, to like materially experience things, to like go out and to actually have these interactions, to actually have, you know, the change, to actually, you know, to actually critically and intentionally engage with everything that is happening. Um, and we fully intend in everything that we do to continue to reestablish and reassert the sentiment and the strength um, and the reality of the popular, popular university campaigns that we're, that we're seeing in all the encampments across the nation. Um, because for me personally, I have not stopped craving returning to that encampment. I have not stopped craving returning to that community um, and returning to that place where Palestine never fell to the to the background um, and where what was happening was always, always, always at the forefront of what we were talking about, what we were thinking, what we were doing. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're in all these spaces and it just seems like you're on a different planet, like in classes, in regular classes at Emerson, you know, we're talking about decolonization, we're talking about occupation, about apartheid, we're talking about the history of all of these things. Um, but then we're closing our eyes when it's when it's in front of us and we're and we're refusing to to say like, oh, actually, that's happening right now, right here. Um, and so. That is the most alienating and it is the most, you know, destructive and I think harmful thing that I think we have as an organization been, you know, trying to resist and trying to deconstruct, you know, since we started, you know, trying to deconstruct the reality that the conversations that we have in the classroom cannot extend beyond, but they can, they absolutely can, you know, the, the things that we are learning, um, I've never, I think, been able to put into practice um, you know, all of the skills that I've built over the last four years and all of the knowledge that I've obtained the way that I was during the encampment. And I completely intend to continue to fight, to, to continue to fight, to find myself and as in my community in, you know, that space. Um, and, you know, accompanied by like the spirit and the fight for the liberation of Palestine, um, you know, until, until it happens. Um, yeah, I had class all that week that we were in the encampment. Uh, I didn't attend a single class because the encampment was my class. And I learned more in that space with those people in that community in the three other years I was at Emerson, completely honestly. Um, I learned about the world. I learned about myself. I learned about my community members. Um, and that is what is so threatening to these institutions that we can, that we could possibly ever take our education into our own hands, that we possibly could ever build community outside of the structures they have imposed on us. And that is terrifying to them, I think, because what we had there was the future. That's what so many of the professors that were there told us. One professor uh, said she uh, she called her mom and said, this is what heaven looks like when we had a Jewish Seder going on with Muslim students, Christian students, and Jewish students all sitting together. And I think what we have going on across the country and across the world will not be stopped because we are a generation that grew up, the first generation to grow up watching genocide and war since we were born since we were born. We we were the first internet natives. We're, we, we grew up in school shooter drills. And there, I can only speak for myself, there, there will be no moment from now on in my life where I am not dedicated to the liberation of the people of Palestine and people all around the world. And I, li I have an immense amount of privilege in that I have been able in the past to tune out of the struggle whenever I've wanted to. But now... That will no longer be possible for me because 
I will not let it be possible for me because we have a movement that is growing around the world and it's growing every day. Every day at our encampment, we were worried that the numbers would wane and we would just get raided by the police that night. It grew every single night. It grew every single night. And we see it on social media. Every university has, has got this going on. The encampments are getting bigger. Every time we think MIT is going to go down, hundreds of people show up and help them out again. And that's what's terrifying is that is the people power. That's what's terrifying to these institutions. Yeah, the even the fact that the idea that we can protect each other is something that they work so hard to 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 deny um, in like the American and Western conscious, like every turn and every twist and turn, we are not told or encouraged to be to trust each other. We're not encouraged or told to be in community and to protect each other. You know, we're told to be silent observers or to look away completely one or the other. Um, and I and just like Owen said, that's exactly what they're that's exactly what is so terrifying. It is so terrifying to them um, to see that you know, now we know that it is enough, like what people can bring to the table, the ways that we can, you know, unite as a community is enough to actually like sustain and build something where you are taken care of, where you're protected, where you're not ever standing alone for anything. Um, and I mean, in general, it's just, it's, it's so it's so unbelievably powerful. And it's something that, again, like I said, I will never stop fighting to be involved in again. I will never stop fighting to be as close to the encampment um, in the spirit of the encampment as 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 much as possible in every way possible. To me, this is really uh, music to my ears because you're you're not just highlighting the Palestinian struggle. You're also highlighting uh, important points like community building, uh, decentralization, uh, also the fact that uh, there's there's an anti-colonial sentiment uh, uh, to it, an anti-liberal sentiment. It's very important because they blindside people like that, you know, with institutions uh, and and media. They they make you think that they care about um, you know minorities, and then in the end, you see that they're part of the structure. And I'm very proud of you guys for outline, outlining that. Uh, just perhaps as, as as a as a last question, I, I I'll I'll try and pack in a few here. How are you guys going to rebuild the encampment or get started again at Emerson? And uh, what would you say to other students? that are listening who maybe don't have an encampment or, or a movement going on yet at their universities? How, how would you motivate them and what tips would you, would you give them? And again, the floor is yours. I think um, for me, I mean, I just wanna, I wanna really, again, emphasize the fact that the way that I've seen, you know, masses of people at Emerson in Boston and across the country, you know, come together and, you know, engage in this type of resistance and in this type of protest, um, in this type of community building would not at all have been possible without everything that Palestine has communicated, like, you know, put without everything that Palestine has put on the line to just communicate these things to us, to just make sure that we could see them and to make sure that we could engage yes. with and understand their struggle. Myself, you know, again, I'm Egyptian and I grew up, I grew up, you know, in proximity and in anticipation of, you know, this type of revolution, this type of, you know, community and this type of reality. But a lot of people cannot say the same. A lot of the, a lot of people, especially, you know, in, at PWIs, at Privileged American Higher Education Students, like institutions, a lot of people could not have ever imagined even remotely being a part of something like that or even remotely, you know, having to confront a shift in consciousness that allowed them to be, to participate that day, allowed them to stand their ground that day. Um, and again, that is Palestine. And as much as, um, as much as, you know, people are thinking us and are being proud of us, we are following we are following the lead of the Palestinian people. We are absolutely following the lead of the Palestinian people and we are doing everything we can for them along the way. And um, I think in terms of rebuilding um, the ways that we're going to continue with the popular university campaign at Emerson, I think that there has been a massive cultural shift at Emerson in terms of not just views on Palestine, but in terms of you know the way that as a community we function. 
um, that will undoubtedly resound um, for, 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 for years, for years to come at the very least. And what I'm as an organizer looking forward to most is, like I said before, the movement is it has grown. It has grown and it's in the people's hands and it's so much bigger than any SJP. It's so much bigger than any JVP, any org student organization at this point. And all we can do is really respect and nourish the type of spontaneity and the type of intuition that allowed us to stand our ground that day and that allowed us to link arms that day and you know protect one each one another um and so i think for us it's going to be a lot about you know nourishing you know our movement has grown and it's going to be a lot about nourishing that growth and it's going to be so much more about you know, continuing to escalate until first we see a ceasefire and then we see an end to the occupation and understanding the ways that this fight does not start. It did not start with the student movement and it will continue on for as long as it needs to way beyond the student movement um, because the encampment, yes, so many students put so much work into all these encampments, but all of it would not have been possible without the support of community members, without the support of, you know, people who have been organizing for these causes and other causes for decades of their lives, without the support of faculty and staff, without the support of, without the support of the houseless people, of the houseless folks who are coming and joining us in the encampment. Like, it's in everybody's hands now. And so, um, yeah, as an organizer, I think, you know, I'm I'm just I'm really looking forward to seeing what the people do um, with this. I think what our encampment showed and what our arrest prior to the encampment showed the people of Emerson is that there is a great deal of power in the people and that we are the people. And I don't think it, it it's unfortunate that it took all of this and not the tens of thousands of lives in Palestine to get people to acknowledge it, but that we have so much power when we come together and these institutions want so desperately for us to think that there is no power in what we do together. Um, mm -hmm. One of the questions we were asking ourselves during the encampment is what even is the value of our degree or a career in the face of a genocide? What, what even, what matters compared to this? And now I'm asking myself, how do we take what we had in the encampment out of the encampment and put it into practice so that everyone can be a part of it? Um, and how do we continue that over the summer because I just know some of these Emerson kids are already, you know, they're getting they're getting ready to go on vacation. They're getting ready to not think about Palestine for a couple months. Um, so how do we keep that going? And what we're really trying to focus on is how do we come into next semester uh, with people ready to to do some shit? Because we had a big big end to our semester, um, but we want to let people know that. That is just the beginning of what we've got going on at school, um, let alone what we got, like what's going on in this movement across the world, but like specifically at Emerson College, this is just the beginning um, and get ready for next semester because, you know, we're not stopping. And something that we um, really emphasize to everyone at the encampment um, and, you know, in the rallies that we had post encampment and all of the gatherings that we had after the after the encampment was raided was that everything that we did there, everyone who experienced that is able to take that home with them over the summer, take that to whatever part of the world that they're going to, whatever part of the country they're going to and harness that, harness that in any way that that is possible. Um, because I mean, these next few months, it's going to be so much about, again, beyond the students, you know, the students, student, we're restricted by, you know, our camp, our semesters ending, we're restricted by our campuses, we're restricted by our administrators, we're restricted by whatever. Um, but there's so many more facets 
outside of these institutions where the popular university and where the encampments can continue and will continue to live on and be established. So, I mean, figuring out every way that you can possibly support that. And if you're a student on a campus that does not have an encampment set up yet, find a campus that does have an encampment set up and go hang out with them. Go, you know, see what you can do, what role you can pay, play at the encampment. And, um, you know, in general, how you can, you know, bridge the organizing or the lack of organizing that's happening in the area that you're in with the organizing that might be happening, you know, nearby or not nearby, because it's so possible. Again, it started with Palestine and now it has completely, you know, taken over so many of our states and our cities and of our, um, of our colleges. And it, all we can do is continue to continue to hope and plan for it to spread. Well, again, I, I'm uh, very, very happy to see these protests, uh, you know, all over the country and, and across the world uh, blowing up and they're only getting stronger. Uh, and, um, you know, again, I, I, I urge you guys to just keep, you know, keep engaging in direct action. You've figured it out and uh, you've got a, a winning strategy. So is there anywhere that, you, that people can, um, you know, find learning materials? Is there anything you'd like to plug, any website or account? Go right ahead. Um, I mean, um, SJP Emerson on Instagram and I think also on TikTok, uh, but on Instagram for sure. Keep up with us because, you know, we're plugged into the student movement in Boston and we're trying our best to, you know, keep up with all the things that are happening, um, not just at Emerson, but, you know, that are happening around the city and that are happening in Palestine. Um, keep eyes on Operation Olive Branch and, you know, um, we have a bunch of uh, resources um, for mutual aid um, on our Instagram that we will continue to put out and continue to share because, I mean, as we're sitting here right now, uh, Rafa is being demolished. It is being attacked. Um, it is being bombarded um, so, so violently. And the way that the violence um, against Gaza and against Rafa has just continuously um, escalated um, I think one thing that a lot of students are really trying to remind everybody right now is with as much, like despite everything that is happening on our campuses, we need to ensure that our eyes remain on Palestine and that our eyes remain on Rafa and that we are doing everything we can um, to like for an immediate, for an immediate and permanent ceasefire and to help the families and the people who are there, um, who are under, who, you know, who seconds, who, yeah, who like are seconds away from something that, you know, we don't even know at all yeah. times. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, we share a bunch of resources. Our biggest thing, I think, as an organization is to remind everybody that everything is connected. Everything that's happening in America, everything that's happening in the UK, everything that is happening around the world and everything that's happening in Palestine, it is all connected. And um that's and you know beyond that everything that's happening in Sudan and Haiti and the Democratic Republic of Congo everything is connected and everything that we fight for we do so in the name of liberation for Palestine and everyone beyond yes. um yeah no, I absolutely agree and uh you know this is this is the the number one message uh, um that that I that I uh broadcast is that it's it's about imperialism in the end you know they, these are just symptoms of imperialism but we 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 have to connect it all and teach people that and so uh again guys please follow um here the instagram account sjp emerson i've put the link in the uh description and in the comment section and uh if you guys want you can tag me and i'll try and boost your posts as a collaborator so uh anytime and thanks for for coming on uh both of you it's it's really been a pleasure speaking and and hearing what you guys are doing at Emerson. Thank you again, Sadia, and thank you, Owen. Really great chatting with you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so sir. much for having us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Again, YouTube demonetized my channel because I'm not allowed to say naughty things about Israel. Um, you know, telling the truth is forbidden. So uh, if you are able to donate a few dollars on PayPal or 
uh, on a monthly basis on Patreon, please consider doing it because it would really help me continue my journalism and support independent media. So I'd be very grateful. And the links are in the uh, description and also in the chat. Thank you guys very much again uh, for all your donations and all your kind comments. I appreciate it very much.